we're getting to talk about the topic of arts being for everyone, and that's such a massive topic. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm an arts journalist, so I'm Aoife Barry, so I, I work and write for a, a range of different publications, and it's really great to chat about this topic, but like I said, it's huge, very broad, and we're going to really focus on what our panellists are doing in their own specific areas, which I think then jumps off into other areas of the arts and creativity and it can kind of hopefully give people a lot to think about I think about what maybe needs to change and what an individual can do to bring about change because all of our panelists are absolutely showing that you have the power to do that yourselves um, so we have Adam O'Brien who is a disability activist and works in the event sector we have Sunil Sharp who is a DJ producer I could go on and on about all the work that you do in an activist as well too um, and Ailish McCarthy who is a comedian and also an activist in terms of getting comedy recognized as an art form in a more official way in Ireland, so we'll, we'll really get into that. But what I'll do, first of all, is I'll get you all to introduce yourselves, how you would like to be introduced, and maybe tell us a bit about the work and the activism work in this space that you've been doing. So, Adam, I'll go to you first on that. Okay, so my name is Adam O'Brien. I am from Dublin. I'm 30. I am autistic. I am dyspraxic. I have generalised anxiety disorder and I have diabetes type 1. And my whole life and mantra about life is about making life easier for other people by sharing my struggles in life. Fantastic. And he's got a really good Instagram page as well. I don't know if you want to tell people what your Instagram handle is. Get the followers. Could you with you? Uh, yeah. I am Adam O'B. Fantastic, and you can catch up with a lot of the, the work that you do there. And we'll get more into how you started that and, and the, the reasons why you got involved in that activism in, in a minute. And Sunil, do you want to tell us about yourself and that sort of work that you've been doing too? People will, be, will have read a lot about it, I'm sure, yeah. in the press. Thanks, Aoife. Yeah, so my name is Sunil Sharp. I've been involved in music since roughly the turn of the millennium. I've been DJing since about 2000, 2001 in clubs um, around the country and quite a bit abroad as well. Um, but somewhere around 2004, almost 20 years ago now, as a kind of emergency response to changes to closing times in nightclubs in Dublin, we had to set up um, a campaign. It was actually an online petition to try to, at the time, save nightclubs or save nightlife because it looked like our, um, our closing times were going to go back from what are now, it's actually the same times today, to half two, uh, three o'clock. Um, they were going to be brought back to half one. I won't go into the whole ins and outs of it, but as an emergency response, we got over 20,000 signatures. We were mentioned in all of the kind of main media pieces on it that week. And a few days later, um, the proposal that was in place from, from the, you know, one of the units, Garda units in, ta in town, um, they decided not to go ahead with that, not to proceed with that. They kind of knew, I guess, that the public weren't in agreement with us, that our campaign was growing. And they, um, th there was a, essentially a, a minor victory for us as a, as a campaign. So within three days or four days to have done all of those things, we thought, what could we do in six months? You know, Maybe we should try and change the licensing laws, not just to try to protect what we have, to try to extend closing times. It goes far beyond just licensing laws today. A lot of it's about access to spaces, protecting spaces, creating new spaces. Uh, but back then, it was about licensing laws. Today, it's still about licensing laws. And that's what we continue to try to change today. Great, and we'll definitely talk um, hopefully a bit about you know the, the slowness of trying to make change. The fact yeah. you can make it, but it can actually be quite slow. Yeah. And Ailish, what about yourself? Yeah, so I'm Ailish McCarthy. I've been doing stand-up comedy the last five years. And uh, the reason I'm on this panel, well, so I'm, I'm a mentor in Mining Creative Minds. I'm also Ambassador Safe Gigs Ireland. Um, and I set up the Irish Comedy Guide with Damo Clark and Eddie Malarkey to kind of have a platform for comedians that doesn't, it didn't previously exist in Ireland, just to share resources. And for the last 18 months, I've been advocating for the Arts Council to fund, support and have a platform for comedians in Ireland. Excellent. It's so interesting. I think I could probably spend you know an hour chatting to each of you individually, but we'll see what we can we can cover here. And Adam, it's a big thing to decide that you want to be you know an activist for a certain cause, whether that's to do with you personally or or something kind of greater. And you know it means you're means you're putting yourself out there. It means you have to be kind of consistent with the work. Can you tell us about your journey with this and when you decided that you wanted to talk about your story and in your journey into working in the events industry? Well, it all came from I lost my brother to suicide, so I decided I was going to organise gigs in memory of him. So I started by doing them, and then that just uh, got my love for the events industry and that kind of thing. 
and then ever since I've been trying to get into the industry in various roles. So I'm currently working for an events company in Dublin as of four months. So I'm trying to make events more easier for other people, which is a battle because most companies just think it's a box ticking exercise. Yeah, tell us a bit, a bit more about that, the box ticking exercise. That people might say, I'm really open to having a person with autism work with me, but how does that actually work in reality? Well, in reality, I went through about, applied for about 200 jobs and only one company ever got back to me, so. So it's a huge challenge. And I mean, do you feel that by talking about it publicly and you're really honest about it on your Instagram that you're helping to show people that might not think about it or might not realize they see it as a box ticking exercise, the reality of it for some, an individual like you? I hope so, anyway. Yeah. You can only do your best, really, yeah. and hope. And you get, I've seen on the Instagram, you get a good response from people. Have people been reaching out and responding to you? Yeah, good enough. That's great. Um, and Sunil, in terms of yourself, you spoke a little bit there about how you can go, you know, practically overnight from realizing actually we need to do something then you know a couple of weeks later you realize actually deciding to do that has an impact and then you get involved in kind of talking to members of government to the minister their office to really trying to kind of get in there into kind of policy makers government how was that process so because I imagine you learn a huge amount in, in getting involved in that world that you know you wouldn't have experience of before yeah there was two like I'm, I wouldn't say that I was um, a very willing spokesperson in the early days and I feel there were probably people within the group that were better able to deal with media and speak to media and go on to radio and had more experience than I did um, but at that point for the campaign to proceed because was sort of let's just call it grassroots activism it is hard to keep people interested over time especially when the initial honeymoon of you know big results like you know over 20,000 signatures and a kind of minor success move on a number of weeks or a number of months and there's, you know, it's, it's just you that's sort of running the campaign then. And that, that's, um, in the early stages, it was like, right, well, I have to be a spokesperson now. I have to go onto the radio. No one else is going to do it. Um, and yeah, definitely had to brush up a lot in the early days and kind of refine how I, how I communicate with media, with politicians as well. So in, in those early days, there would have been quite a few meetings with, with, with politicians, but a lot of appearances on, you know, on radio and television. Um, I've, look, I've seen some of that. I was definitely rough around the edges. I didn't look at the camera. I was kind of looking down. I was just a bit kind of quite nervous, to be honest. And um, I think like, that can happen any time. That can, that can creep up any time if you're not prepared as well. And it often happens today where all of a sudden a new story just breaks and we have to like speak to the media very suddenly. So you always have to be kind of prepared and always ready. And I think for somebody like myself who works at the weekend, sometimes very late as well, you have to be sometimes prepared to be going onto radio on Monday morning, getting a, you know, getting a, a call from somebody, you know, on Sunday night, will you, are you up for talking on the breakfast show at half seven, you know? So I think Ellen, parts of, of the kind of campaigning and if you, we want to call it activism, um, took a little bit of uh, getting used to. But th there was two stages of Give Us the Night, from 2004 to about uh, 2011. There were amendments made to licensing legislation in 2008. Um, when in opposition at the time, just as spokesperson for Fina Gale, actually uh, Charlie Flanagan uh, proposed an amendment to licensing laws then in the form of a nightclub license. Uh, fast forward 15 years and he's telling the current justice minister not to do it. So, um, the vagaries of politics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are the things you have to get your head around sometimes, and just kind of, um, just kind of get on with it, you know. And how do you deal with that? You know, when you're campaigning for something, and you're in the meeting room with somebody who's, you know, got a lot of power, and they're like, "Yes, that sounds great. Let's keep all my clubs open till four, four a.m. or six a.m." Um, and then you, you know, you might wake up the next day, and there might be a new Taoiseach, or there might be, you know, changes in the department, or you might get an email saying, actually, there's something else we have a priority for. How do you deal with that and keep the momentum going? Yeah, I mean, I get very frustrated with the communications of the government. I mean, I think when Leo Varadkar was in there, he spoke from personal experience. If you're to go, if, and it depends on the journalist as well, if you're to speak to Hall Martin now, uh, the general question that we asked to Hall Martin was, oh, when was the last time you were in a nightclub? And everyone will start giddily laughing and it, it's a joke, you know, and it's all, it's all very jovial and it's, 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 it's something to laugh about. Um, and, you know, if you ask him or Simon Harris, when was the last time you were in a nightclub? They don't remember. Ask Leo Varadkar when the last time he was in a nightclub. He'd be able to tell you and he'd be able to give you, 
you know, uh, some reasoning as to why these laws should change. Eamon Ryan, I don't know the last time Eamon Ryan was in a nightclub, but I know that he... Maybe he's in it loads, you never know, yeah. He, he seems to have some insight into it as well and, and knows why, it, why it's a good idea, but it does feel pretty much overnight that a lot of the, the messaging um, around licensing from a government point of view has kind of... Um, has been frozen. It's just been put into a bottle, it's airtight, and it's not going anywhere for the moment. Um, the legislation's ready to go. If you ask the Justice Department now, they'll tell you we're working on it. It's ready. It was ready a long time ago. They inherited an old bill as well. They didn't have much to, to do on that. So, yeah, it's... Yeah. Yeah. Keeping going, despite yeah. the fact that, you know, with politics and with government, things yeah. can be as slow as we, treacle. We, we'll say. be here for as long as we need to, even yeah. after Simon Harris is gone, if he doesn't want to put it through now. But we hope he, we hope mm -hmm. he will. So keep keeping going with that. Yeah. And, and Eilish, I mean, when you're hearing Sunil's experience there, um, you know, does that make you reflect on the process for you? And I suppose the fact that it can be, uh, you know, we're trying to make change. It can be something that there can be a lot of movement. It can slow, back, slow down and you have to, to sit with that. Yeah, um, so thankfully, like, although I'm at the forefront of the advocacy for comedy, thankfully it's not just me. Um, like, I've had amazing support from my new creative minds. Uh, I've had amazing support from, like, the uh, journalists in this country as well, Safety Eggs Ireland, who are really pushing, going, yes, comedy should be an art form. Um, the Department of Tourism, Arts, Culture and Skills have recognised comedy. Uh, the nighttime economy recognizes comedy. The arts uh, offices around the country recognize comedy. I just, I, I've singled out the arts council that just have, like, so the name of this panel is Arts and Cultures for Everybody. There's just that disconnect between the strategy between different institutions. However, they advocate saying, yes, it's for everybody. Yes, everyone should get involved. We're here to fund. And I'm just finding a disconnect. I'm finding gaps. Um, which is a huge issue uh, during the advocacy of it. And can you explain for people who might not be sure in the audience, when you're talking about getting comedy recognised as an art form, what that would mean in practice and then the, you know, the impact of that? Yes. So um, now other art forms like DJing or even musical theatre or podcasting, you guys are all familiar with not being inside, rather. And there's very much a group think if you're not one of us, you're outside. So I've been struggling to try to get people on board, get... Um, what is it, allies. Now, I've been very fortunate, like again, I can't commend Mining Creative Minds enough because they were a huge um, ally for us to be recognized or even the department saying, yes, you're an art form. Um, but in terms of how the process, like we've had some really great milestones for people who want to get an art form recognized. So we wrote to the department first going, are we an art form in the Arts Act, yes or no? Like we're not there with architecture or theater or opera, but in the definition of art forms, and they came back saying, yes, you are. And second to that, I, we signed, uh, we got a petition. Now, unfortunately, it wasn't as successful as 20,000 signatures, but we got like over 1,000 signatures. And then we had another milestone, which was a piece in RT where I was just saying, I, like, in this country, is comedy supported by um, the country or not? And through my research, I just found that the Arts Council was a complete contrast to all the other institutions that I, rec that I mentioned in the culture and arts. And um, the Arts Council was asked to comment, and instead of saying, no, she's totally wrong, they said, we will look into this, which only solidified my point even more. Yeah. And then we also have a bill submitted to the Oireachtas for comedy to be a listed art form. It's going to be voted on very, uh, very soon. So um, these were kind of the structures that are in place that I've used, uh, because they're all public bodies. The public can use these, or even customer charters. So I was trying to get a response back from the Arts Council, and I go, here's your customer charter. You need to get back to me in five days. <laughs> Um, and they're like, yeah, it's there. So um, in terms of trying to get it off the ground, um, trying to get people behind it, it has been you know, a bit of a struggle. Now, if we were to be recognized as an art form, what does that mean? Sorry, going back to the original question. It means that we have access to develop and write new work. We, have, uh, we can create more jobs, more paid jobs, because at the moment, you know, if you want to tour a show, like you have to pay the electrician, you have to pay the producer, you have to pay for marketing costs. These are all out of the pockets of comedians who are still in a situation which many people find familiar of living at home and funding yourself. We don't have access to that. So you're saying there, sorry, that arts, specifically then if, if the Arts Council recognised comedy, it would then have specific funding strands for a comedy that would then enable people obviously not to be 
paying out of pocket. Or and, and that's exactly what we're saying, is that we're not contesting the bursaries or the support structures are, um, that are currently in place. We just want access to have the same crack of the whip. Like, you have the first Fortnite festival, which we, like, which we are involved in, but there are obviously bursaries in Dublin Fringe that get you into the first Fortnite festival. You have the Agility Award, which is five grand to develop and write new material for an artist who is zero to five years working in this country. And then you have like the touring award, the like we have many gigs in Irish, by the way, that would really benefit from artists who are uh, around longer than three years. Again, it's down to the quality assessment if they apply and if they're successful. That's still with the Arts Council, but uh, mentorships, um, residencies, workspaces, we don't have this access. And it's, uh, which was frustrating because obviously in the pandemic, Everybody was kind of looking at comedy. You know, Joanne McNally blew up with her, um, uh, my therapist ghosted me. And then to come back from the pandemic without being a recognized artist and have a, a crack of the whip, it's very unethical. It's so interesting because, yeah, like you say, I mean, the pandemic in particular, we saw just a swathe of social media comedy that Ireland's really, really proud of. And there's people making really good money touring and really kind of getting great reputation. But if that's not backed up by, um, I suppose, funding or recognition do, yeah. and mentorship, does it show, like, it, it shows, I suppose, in your mind, a, a hierarchy. And where do you think that that kind of viewpoint of comedy is maybe not an art form or not worthy of being treated the same as other art forms comes from? Um, from the interactions I've had, the department recognised comedy. They go, yeah, you're in the Arts Act. I provided that document to the Arts Council saying, well, the people who fund you and assign your board members recognise us. <laughs> this is the official document, so why are your policies in contrast to this? Yeah. The Nighttime Economy fund uh, comedy gigs as well. Arts offices like the Helix funded Diane O'Connor's uh, Accidental Activist. So why there's a, just a, that disconnect. They see it as commercial and it's like, Trust me, it is not commercial. So I started the Irish Comedy Guide to do like a video series of gigs around the country, like the International, Cherry Comedy in Whelan's, um, also access to clubs, just to let comedians know what promoters they can get in touch with, who they can talk to. Um, Fred Cook lives in Kerry and he goes, wow, there's no comedy clubs in Kerry. This is the market for me. Mm -hmm. And he started a monthly comedy club. So. These are things like that don't exist, but when you like, I just had to build it. Yeah. And um, now it's kind of it's a little bit better than what it is, but we still don't have access to, like, we don't have access to the um, basic income for artists. We don't have access to um, residencies and spaces that other art forms have access to. We can't apply because we're already at the door, going, you can't come in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And. Like, however, they're all flying the flag of arts and culture is for everyone, and we're like, well, there's a disconnect there yeah. between practice and um, your policies. Yeah, it's one thing to say something, but actually, what's it like in, in reality? And, and that brings me to, to you and, and your work, Adam, and that idea we're talking there about a hierarchy and some people are seen as being higher up than others. And do you feel, you know, the people who want to work in the arts space who have a disability of any form are really kept, you know, at the bottom at a lower rung, like aren't thought about? Yeah, I really do, especially with, like, even in my job at the moment, I feel there's a lot of people that think they're bigger than me, and I'm just there because I'm autistic and I'm a box ticking exercise, so, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, when you're doing that work then and you might come up against attitudes from people, is, that, is it easy to respond to that or to say to somebody something about it, or do you feel it's actually very hard in the moment to communicate how you're feeling about that to them? Yeah, it's very hard in the moment because people really don't actually understand autism because people have this preconceived idea, oh, you have this autistic nephew who likes trains, we all like trains. <laughs> I fucking hate trains. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then yeah. there's also, when you get into, say for example, I'll give an example of a recent festival I did freelance on that I got the call the night before from. So I was doing Forbidden Fruit in Dublin. They had two wheelchair toilets. Only one of them could be accessed because the spacing, the stuff like that, simple things that doesn't cost money. There was no lights. The uh, soap wasn't the correct height, stuff like that. And I think, and that's actually people haven't read, and, and I know you know Louise Bruton who writes the Legacy of Dublin newsletter and, you know, does so much work around, like, letting people know about all of these really, really basic things that are forgot, forgotten about. And you do um, we, consultation, don't I you, have, on this? Yeah, I, I, I actually hosted a panel at Ireland Music Week last year 
where that was the only talk that was accessible. None of the music gigs were accessible, so it shows that it's just a box ticking exercise. Like, even look at this stage, not accessible. Yeah, I mean, thanks so much for pointing that out. It's those things that we don't recognise when you, you when you have the ability to, to do something, uh, you know, differently to somebody else. And like, another one I'll yeah, do quickly is please do. forbidden fruit. Uh, they won't lend autistic people up on the viewing area. Okay, is that something you come across a lot? That yeah. there's a certain yeah uh, certain people are allowed and certain yeah. people aren't. Yeah. So, and then you're only meant to have one friend. Yeah. So how do you pick one friend? Yeah. So. <laughs> It's so like it's so true, and I think it points out the like the ignorance that a lot of us have. You know, I can kind of rock up to a festival, and I don't have to think about these things. And if I'm making decisions, how does that impact the decisions I'm I'm making? When you're working in the festival, what else have you spotted that you've thought, hang on, nobody's thought about this? How long do we have? Yeah. <laughs> it's literally I, I could go yeah. on and on and on, and then like say for example, I've worked on festivals that they've advertised they have a disability viewing area, no viewing area. Then again, that festival doesn't exist anymore because they paid no one. So, yeah. like, I mean, it, it's it's really interesting. I think hearing you talk about this because I know this is something that people have been raising for such a long time. This is not something that has just appeared on the agenda. Maybe more people are unfortunately just paying attention to it now. How easy is it to, or hard is it to keep on being an activist and talking about this when you know that it's it's a very slow process? People don't seem to always be getting it. It's kind of, I go through phases of it. I go on three or four months and then you just switch off. You can't do anything about it because you're just like banging your head against a brick wall. Yeah. yeah I, I can imagine that's like that frustration. I mean, and when you're working then in the festivals, can you tell us about what you love about getting to do that work? Because you've worked at a few different events recently and I know you had photos and things like that up there. You want to tell us about what, what's been the great stuff about working at them? It's just, I feel that creative freedom, like mm -hmm. that. I, it's me managing stuff, but it's only when I get on the day managing stuff for most festivals. So it's like you're trying to solve problems yeah. before they happen, that kind of stuff. So I love that kind of thing. Excellent. And Sunil, I mean, when we're talking about how people view different, um, we're talking about how they view different people, but also different art forms, talking about Ailish's work, um, is there like a snobbery around the, the nighttime industry in Ireland and the idea of, you know, well, just, they're just DJs, or you know, the, 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 are you come across that kind of hierarchical attitude yourself? Yeah, and I mean, it's, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be just um, Ireland either, but I think the difference with Ireland is, is we didn't have, I think in other countries, if we're to isolate, let's say, Germany, even the UK, Belgium, Holland, there was a smoother transition from guitar music and rock music. Um, even like just, just to, to highlight like an act like uh, Kraftwerk. I mean, they, they previously like, you know, played with guitars and then moved into electronics and it was kind of like a, a hybrid style that they had at the beginning. So, you know, for, so a lot of these countries had like decades of, of a head start on us. Um, and then of course, when club culture and electronic music within club culture started to become prominent, it was sometimes for the wrong reasons, you know? And I think nightlife has had a really hard time kind of living down those days, like the kind of the heady days of the 90s and even the early 2000s. Nightlife is very, very different to that now. We have a lot less um, clubs. I mean, uh, it's a statistic, it's a piece of data that's been kind of quite heavily shared since we put it out there um, a few years ago. But in the year 2000, there were 522 nightclubs there are now approximately 85 to 90. And not everyone would consider all of those uh, current nightclubs to be actual nightclubs in, in the way that they used to be. Um, go back a little bit further again, back to the, to the 1950s, there were 1,300 uh, dance halls, um, licensed dance halls, um, and about the same again, um, unlicensed dance halls. So our access to dance spaces has um, drastically, you know, um, diminished. And uh, I, I think it's not even just about the music or people's um, associations with particular scenes or subcultures. It's about our access to spaces to dance in, you know. A lot of the, the, the feel-good, uplifting stories that we all experienced and, uh, and witnessed during the pandemic were, were around dancing, you know. It was all the young girls and their mothers dancing down, I think, in Irish town to, to Wigfield on Saturday night. It was the guards uh, dancing on a cliff somewhere, I think, in the west of Ireland. Um, recently, it's the, it's the, the cabin crew's hit um, down in Cork, you know, where they're, where they're all singing and dancing, you know. And dancing used to be really embedded very strongly into our social scenes, you know. And I think that's 
I think this is something where kind of maybe older people need to be a little bit more responsible about this as well. All of the things that they took for granted when they were growing up, which were multiple choices in, a, in small rural areas of places to go and dance. Now these areas don't have a place to dance. Some counties are down to their very last uh, venue. So it goes beyond even electronic music. That's something I could probably talk about for a while too. It's just about our basic access to dance spaces and making these venues uh, financially sustainable. And to come back to what Ailish is talking about as well, we, we definitely suffer from being put into that bracket of the commercial sector. Whether you're in the funded sector or commercial sector, you need support now. And I think that's a conversation that needs to be on the table. And we, you know, in the, in the run-up to budgets now as well, um, I know, listen, Catherine Martin's been a great minister, and I'm not sure who will follow her. They'll, they, whoever it is, they'll have you know, big shoes to fill. Um, but definitely one of the things we need to be pushing for is more budget for, for arts and culture and, and for other art forms that, that, that need it more and need to get more than what they're currently getting. You know? Yeah, I think Ireland's very proud of its green wave over the last while, but you can't have a green wave if people aren't, you know, being helped, supported and, and funded and have, have accessibility. Um, and Ailish, you, you mentioned your work with Safe Gigs Ireland as well. And it's, I think the comedy scene is an interesting one because there can be like a history in comedy of kind of misogynist comedy. And um, I think women coming up in the comedy scene or people of different genders coming up in the comedy scene have a lot to contend with in terms of the history, but it also feels like quite a very welcoming space in Ireland. Can you tell us a bit about negotiating that and the work with safe gigs as well too in that yes. sphere. So 25% uh, of comedians in the country identify as women and then 12% identify as either non-binary LGBTQ comics and I think 8% because I did the survey lads uh, are uh, comics of colour um, but uh, yeah, Safe Gigs Ireland do tremendous work. They do fantastic work, and they're, um, I would follow them. Do their, uh, they're doing a campaign on stalking at the moment, and they're doing tremendous work with the Department of Justice. Uh, we've also, uh, since the pandemic, uh, a focus group created uh, comedy safety standards, which was our own blueprint of, let's say, um, safe nights in Ireland. And we got support from Mining Creative Minds and Safe Gigs Ireland to do up a blueprint so that comedy clubs around the country, because they often book a room, they, they don't own the space the way Project Art Centre own their own theatre, right? So we would often go to a venue going, we would like to book this room at this certain time. But there's like a, um, what is it? A, a, a safety standards on the, on the wall saying, you know, if you have anything to report, come to us. And I saw it over in Edinburgh as well. Like we're trying to stay at a European level. Um, something that I just, because I know that we're uh, just, uh, adding on to someone's yeah. point that I just want to add on about everyone supporting going behind the arts. Can I just go back to that? Yeah, absolutely. It's all our responsibilities. I, and there's such a group think in Ireland is if you're not one of us, you're not one of us. And it, our case is our own. There need to be more uh, allies and multidisciplinary support. So like I've been struggling with comedy, reaching out to people going, uh, OK, people have come to me saying the local election's coming up. Make sure you talk about basic income for, for the arts. And I go, well, when you're talking to them, can you also talk about comedy? Mm -hmm. And they say, well, we're driving this and it's disheartening and we should all be advocating for arts together and we should all be supporting each other's efforts, whether it's identified as commercial or not or different art forms. We should all be banding together. That's the main takeaway I want to have. That's a great way, I think, to end it because it ties everything together that we've been talking about. Adam, Sunil and Ailish, thank you so much for your fantastic um, contributions there. And thank you to the audience.